We are taking time to celebrate the birth of Jesus all week this week. So why don't you come and celebrate with us? Jesus is the true reason for the season. And this week on the Good News Program, Greg Fritz gives you a deeper look into the birth of Jesus. Watch this week's entire series on our YouTube channel by searching for Greg Fritz Ministries. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hi, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News Program. We're doing this um, special series of messages or programs on Christmas, the birth of Jesus. And it's something worth celebrating. You know, I looked, uh, I looked up all the federal holidays in the United States. Now, this doesn't count in other countries, but in the United States, there are 10 federal holidays. And really, Christmas is the only one I mean, we own that one. You, you got to admit, we own Christmas because without Christ, there would be no Christmas. And so that's really the only Christian holiday other than maybe Thanksgiving. But <clears throat> I'm not sure if Thanksgiving has kind of gotten lost in the shuffle. Uh, I think people are thankful, all right, maybe for a lot of things. But um, you can use the, the, the topic of Thanksgiving to thank anything or anyone. Uh, but Christmas, it's hard to separate someone's, the celebration of someone's birthday from that person. And so Christmas is all about Jesus. And we want to make it about Jesus and take some time. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have, you know, meals. You know, God used feasts and celebrations throughout the Old Testament for his people to come apart and relax and and eat and fellowship and enjoy themselves and there's nothing wrong with that but i'm just saying let's not leave jesus out of all of the fun because without him well not only there would would, would there not be a christmas there wouldn't be a world and we'll get into that in another study but without jesus there wouldn't be any good news there would be nothing to live for uh, so, you know, to celebrate uh, his birthday is an honor, it's a privilege, it's fun, and, uh, and it should be something that we enjoy. And he enjoys seeing us have fun with friends and family or whatever you do on, during the holiday season. And so we read in Luke and in Matthew, we, we read the Christmas story in the last program, and I'm going to continue that because... We, we actually stopped at the point where the angel had given Mary the promise um, and, and she was expecting, she was pregnant. Joseph was convinced that it was God and now they're waiting to, to give birth to the Messiah. Uh, the angel made it clear that this was going to be the king of kings and he was going to rule and sit on the throne of his father David and rule forever. And so... Uh, uh, I love this. I'm going to read this now and then we'll get back to Luke's account as we read through this step by step. But in Galatians 4 verse 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. So the fullness of time had come. Now, think about this. God made promises throughout the Old Testament. He started actually in, in Genesis at the fall of, of Adam and Eve when he spoke to the serpent and said, there's coming one that's going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. That was thousands of years before the actual birth of Jesus. And then there are many prophecies uh, con he continued to prophesy the birth of Jesus. Isaiah, we read the different uh, prophecies in Isaiah where this will be a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and he'll be Emmanuel. And, uh, and then Isaiah says, you know, that he'll, uh, a child is born and a son is given, uh, showing the humanity and the deity of Jesus. So these promises were made over 4,000 years. And then the Bible says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Well, there is nothing. I, I mean, as far as we can tell, there was nothing going on politically, uh, economically, socially, you know, in the, in the, in the stars. I mean, ex except for the star that shined, you know, once Jesus was born. But there wasn't anything going on. It just seemed like an ordinary time, an ordinary day. And God began to move and do what he promised to do 
at the right time. What I'm saying is when God makes promises, when God gives you uh, assurances about what He wants to do, what He's going to do in your life, there's, you just believe it. There's, there's nothing to indicate that He is or is not going to do it or when or when He is or isn't going to do it. There was not like a clock, you know, in the sky or something they could watch to say, you know what, I think the Messiah is going to come this week. They had no idea. In fact, the Jewish leaders literally crucified Jesus. They missed the fact that it was, it was the fullness of time. They missed the fact that Jesus was their Messiah. And so um, when the fullness of time is something that is in God's control completely. No one on earth knows how to tell time like God does. In fact, Peter said, you know, I gave up trying to tell time with God because a day with God is like a thousand years and a thousand years with God is like a day. And so there's just, it just doesn't compute the same way. But you can believe this and count on this, that Jesus was born right on time. You say, whose time? God's time. God had it all planned. He knew exactly what was going to happen when, and he was right on schedule. He didn't get pushed into a corner and say, what am I going to do about sin? Let's figure something out. He already had this planned before the foundation of the world. And so it was just a matter of it, of it, of it unfolding when the fullness of time had come. And so that's what we're dealing with. And Mary probably had no warning whatsoever that she was about to really have a hand in changing the entire world. So in Luke chapter 2, uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> we're going to continue reading the Christmas story out of the book of Luke. It's my favorite account and it gives us uh, more details than the other writers. So in Luke chapter 2 verse 24, then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel commanded him and took his wife and did not know her until she brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah of the days of Herod, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he? And so uh, we're going to look at the wise men and the things that they did. The book of Luke gives us a few more details than the other writers. And so we're going to go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 1, as we continue the, uh, the, the birth of, of Jesus and the story of his birth and the events surrounding it. So Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree, now Mary is pregnant now, and, and Joseph is still taking care of the family, just waiting for Jesus' birth. And it came to pass, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This consensus first took place, or this census first took place while Quirinius was governor, governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So this is a Roman empire, the Roman empire, and Caesar said, I want to count everyone in the, in, the, in the empire. I want everyone to be counted. So every person had to go back to their hometown, the city of their birth or their lineage. And uh, verse 4, it says, now Joseph and Mary, I believe, were living in Nazareth at the time. And so they went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now the prophets, the prophets already told us that the, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but no one expected it to be so subtle, so so. Well, I'll just read it and you'll see what I mean. Because he was in the house of, of the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, the King James says she was great with child. And this is interesting because nothing went like you would expect it to go. Jesus, Mary was pregnant with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I mean, the angel even said he's going to be a king. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. So obviously she knows she's going to have a king. She's going to give birth to the Messiah. And so while she's waiting 
and she, she's almost, you know, it's almost, she's almost due. And this decree comes out, no cooperation from the Roman government. They said, you've got to go back to your hometown. And so they have to go to Bethlehem. They live in Nazareth. It's 65 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Doesn't sound like much today with, you know, with nice luxury cars and interstate highways. But in those days, it was a, a, a dirt road and she was going to ride on a donkey. It took three days or more <clears throat> to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem on a donkey. That's tr traveling 20 miles a day. And you could just imagine what a, a young woman would feel like when they're great with child and they get this or not uh, this command, this decree. Now you've got to ride a donkey for the next three days to go to Bethlehem. It's like, man, that that would not be pleasant. Now, I've never ridden a donkey when I'm, you know, pregnant. There's a few reasons why. But those of you who have been pregnant, how would you like to ride a donkey for three days at, at eight and a half months pregnant? I mean, what a deal. You, you know, it's like, and yet all of these things were in God's control. The Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. Now, God could have told them, just go to Bethlehem for the birth. He could have had maybe a, a, a room ready for them and, a, and maybe a hospital and, and a, you know, a midwife or, or a doctor. And, and he could have had everything just laid out and rolled out the red carpet uh, for this prophecy to come to pass. But he didn't. It's like it just happened. They, they would have had the baby in Nazareth, except Caesar commanded them to go to Bethlehem. So she's got to ride a donkey for three days when she's at least eight months pregnant. And, and then they finally get to Bethlehem and there was no rooms because everyone had had to come back and they must not have gotten there soon enough to get a room. So now it's even worse. You're, you've just ridden three days on a donkey. You're tired. You're dirty. You're, you're pregnant and there's no room. And so it's like, where are the fringe benefits from having, giving birth to a king? Is, is there no, you know, where's that angel? <laughs> if Gabriel would just come back, maybe he could pull some strings or get me a room. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not just going to give birth. I'm going to give birth to the king. Well, Jesus was unlike any king that we've ever seen or ever will see. He was the servant king. And he came humble and lowly and, and, and he was born in a stable because that's the way God wanted it. I, I, God never ceases to amaze me. The way he does things is so unlike what we would think or we would do. Uh, and so they couldn't get a room, but, 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 they, but they were, I mean, think about this. They look all over town for a room and finally some guy says, look, I have a, a, a barnyard back there. Um, make yourself at home. <laughs> There's hay and animals and uh, all the eggs you can eat, <laughs> chickens, um, cows, j you know, I mean, that's the best we can do. I mean, nobody offered to give her their room. Nobody offered to let her sleep on their couch. I mean, it was like you, you can go stay in a stable. Unbelievable. I, I could just imagine my mom, if she was pregnant and she had to ride three days on a donkey and gets to this destination, she didn't want to go there to begin with, and there's no room. And, and she's got to go stay in the barnyard with, you know, with the animals. And, and it goes on to say that Jesus was born and laid in a trough. A trough. That's not even you know, sanitary. And so anyway, uh, amazing. It's just amazing. The, the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus, the love that God has for humanity. Uh, he, he came into this world saying, I'm not better than you. I'm not up here and you're down here. I'm not going to be detached. I'm one of you. And I'm going to be born in a place that, that none of you would even want to be born in. He, he was not afraid to go 
you know, to the wrong side of town or the other side of the tracks or however you want to say it. He is a king of the people for sure. And, uh, and so she brought forth, this is verse seven, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And that word is literally a feed trough because there was no room for them in the inn. And, uh, and so that's where the king was born. Oh my goodness, born in a, and laid in a feed trough and wrapped in swaddling clothes. And you know, all the manger scenes. Let me just say this. Uh, you may be home alone right now, and that's why you're watching this program. Can I just tell you you're not alone? Don't let the Christmas season be uh, have an adverse effect on you. You may not be with friends and family like maybe you have been in the past, whether they've moved or, or, or maybe like my grandfather, he lived till he was 90-something, and he just outlived a lot of his friends. And, uh, and so you may be alone this Christmas season, but don't get depressed. You can celebrate Christmas. You can celebrate the birth of Jesus. I, I just, you know, it just hit me that, that, that Christmas is bigger than friends and family. And, and friends and family are important, don't get me wrong, but not everyone can be with their family this week. Not everyone is going to be able to connect like, like, like they used to. Uh, things change, but you know, you can still celebrate the birth of Jesus and we can still have, you know, be in awe of what God did for us and what he was willing to do for us. You know, it's like, it's like Jesus didn't have any negotiations <laughs> with, with, you know, I'll be the Messiah, but... I'm going to have to have a good retirement plan. I got to have protection. I got to have, you know, I want to, I want to be born in the finest hospital. I want to have uh, the finest salary. I want the best equipment money can buy. I want bodyguards. And he didn't, he didn't negotiate. He was born in a manger. He was born with, out back with the animals. And, uh, and that's the way God wanted it. Just amazing to me. Uh, and you can celebrate that. We can be happy about that. We can rejoice, uh, whether we're with family and friends or not. But, but, but do something that would help celebrate the season. Uh, sing Christmas carols. If you can't sing, play them. You know, you can, you can get Christmas CDs and music, or if you have a, uh, a music service, they can play Christmas songs. And, and play the Christmas songs that really celebrate Jesus. Uh, not the ones, you know, uh, there, uh, there's nothing wrong with some of these songs, but, I mean, Rudolph and, and you know, uh, uh, what is that, Jingle Bell Rock? They, I mean, I guess Jingle Bells now is too tame. They wanted to make it Jingle Bell Rock because it's more secular maybe. I don't know, but, but uh, that's fine. Uh, people can celebrate Christmas so, however they want, but there are some great Christmas songs uh, that literally celebrate the birth of Jesus and talk about this moment in time. And also, uh, go to a Christmas play or, or a living uh, nativity scene or do something like that. You know, they have those all over the place. Don't just sit at home and and, and feel, you know, alone and, and separated. Uh, get involved. Do something for someone else. Get involved in some church outreach where, where you're able to take some time and money and, and give something to someone else uh, because that, 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 that's the way to celebrate. Jesus doesn't want anyone home this week sad and depressed over, over this holiday season. That's just not right. The enemy wants that. God does not want that. Let's fight against it. And I'm going to talk more about that as we go through this, this whole week. But I'll tell you, we can get happy. Uh, joy to the world, the Lord has come. That is a Christmas verse and a Christmas attitude. We are thrilled today because the Lord has come. So Jesus was born in a manger. He was born in a stable because he was and is the servant king. Let me read this to you, uh, Philippians 2, 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And he did come in the likeness of 
of men. He was born as a human baby in a manger and laid in a feed trough. And uh, man, that's quite a picture. And I know we romanticize the uh, manger scene because it's holy. I mean, if Jesus, if God, the Son of God is going to be born in a manger, it's going to be sanctified, holy, anointed, uh, wonderful. In fact, there's no place you'd rather be than where Jesus is. So I bet for that, for that Christmas season, that manger was the best place on earth to spend Christmas because Jesus was right there. What, what a blessing for the people. And we'll look at some of them that did recognize what was going on. But by and large, the world didn't realize what was happening in that manger that week. They just didn't realize it. It says, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So uh, John says it this way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow, you know, it would have been so easy to underestimate the importance of this baby laying in a feed trough in the middle of a stable, surrounded by his caring parents who didn't have the money or the foresight to get a room in the inn. Uh, you, you would not believe if you were just looking on as an outsider that this baby is the Son of God and he's going to change the entire world world, past, present, future. This baby is going to save the world. Wow. What, what, a, what an opposite extremes. Uh, God does the most amazing things in the most ordinary ways. <laughs> All right. So then I want to give you some scriptures. Jesus carried this attitude throughout his life. And uh, in, in Matthew 20, verse 25, Jesus called them to himself, the disciples, because they were arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> he could have told them a story. Guys, I was born in a stable. Let me tell you about greatness. You want to talk about great? I went, I walked to school in the snow, uphill both ways. You know the stories. But he really was born in a manger. And they're talking about who's the greatest. So he says, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. For whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, that's, this is where he's getting into, look, look what I did. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, and so this is the attitude of God. Uh, Jesus is saying, you, you can't be, you can't act like you're all that when, when you're following me. And, and, and I divested myself of all of my heavenly privileges to become a human. So if you're going to follow me, you just, you got to have that same attitude where we're here to help people. We're here to serve people. We're here to bless people. And, uh, and so he used another illustration to get this point across in John chapter 13. He, before, this was the night before his, uh, his trial and uh, he, his betrayal, and he washed the disciples' feet. What a picture of a servant king. He was no less king. He was no less God at that moment. In fact, he was always God and always uh, you know, and he became a man, but, but he washed their feet as the servant king. And they were embarrassed. And Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet because Peter still didn't get it. And then Jesus could have gone back and told him the story. Hey, I was God. I was sitting on the throne in heaven and I was born in a manger. Get off your high horse. And so uh, he said, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you're not going to be you're not going to be part of my kingdom what I do and so Peter says well Peter was always all or nothing he says well don't just wash my feet wash my whole body and Jesus says, no you just just sit down and shut up and so he washed his feet and then he explained it he said do you know what I've done to you you call me teacher and lord and you say well for so I am 
If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And this is just taking on that form of a servant. Paul said it in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And Jesus used this foot washing ceremony as an opportunity to to teach them that this is about reaching out. Uh, You know, what God did through Jesus, and, and it began in that manger, what God did there was to come down on our level and everything Jesus did was for us. None of it was for him. Every, when he left heaven, it was for us. And everything he did throughout his life and ministry and death, burial, and resurrection, it was all done for us. He said, the servant is not greater than the master. If I came and all I did was serve humanity, you're not going to do any different or you're not my servant. So you can got to get with the program. And he's saying, you know, the Gentiles, they lord it over people, but that's not how this kingdom operates. Isn't that beautiful? I just love it. And he didn't just preach sermons, but Jesus lived what he was preaching. He lived it. He was born in a manger, and that's where it all started. And he grew up in in the world. And uh, anyway, we're going to talk about some of those who did recognize Jesus, uh, who he was and and honored him, but it was very few. This was done and the world was not paying attention. The the religious leaders were not paying attention. And uh, and yet God was doing his work on earth and the salvation of humanity was being set up. uh, And it started in the most uh, obscure, out of the way place. And that just blesses me. Well, I trust you're having a good Christmas week. You know, don't look at what you don't have this week. Look at what you do have. And the the greatest gift you have is the gift of God's own Son. So I want to say as we close again today, Merry Christmas to you. Happy New Year. And uh, don't miss the next program. Remember this, the good news is so good, the bad news doesn't matter. All of us at Greg Fritz Ministries want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. I'd like to remind you that we love our viewers, our audience. They mean the world to us. And if you have not received a Christmas card from my wife and I, please call our helpline or email us. Go to the website, gregfritz.org. Call the helpline, 918-749-7744, and request your Christmas card today. We would like to share some Christmas cheer with you this year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Contact us to receive your Christmas card from Greg Fritz Ministries by emailing info at gregfritz.com or call us at 918-749-7744. I love Greg Fritz's ministry. I love the way he teaches faith and the way he teaches healing. It's phenomenal. To me, when Greg teaches, he ministers to the heart. From seeing him on TV and then seeing him in person, he's real. You know, he's honest. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Partner with us to tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ.